food is <laughs> really hard to get by. They have to queue in the morning to eat something, to bring some bread to their children in the evening. But no, they're queuing to, to have this sort of uh, Michelin star baguette or something. Um, so it's, it is kind of interesting because that's another form art takes. That's just another art form. That's what food is. Yeah? And it's quite interesting also to think about the various artists who are using food or making food as an art form. That's something that we mentioned, Hema, um, in the uh, when we had a chat earlier uh, this week. So that's one thing I think is interesting to think about. The other thing I wanted to mention is that so you had your interim show. And any any impressions? Any impressions from the interim show? Okay, everyone can say something. What is your impression? It was busy. Okay, what is your impression? <laughs> Is it busy? Messy. Messy. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Like a party. Sorry? Like a party. Like a party. <laughs> okay, someone from here, from this side. A lot of waiting. A lot of waiting. Anatoly? Uh, I didn't have it. Um, you're good. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Sexy. 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 <laughs> okay. Interesting. And um, <laughs> and um, everyone can throw my heart in the bin, <laughs> right? So I could, yeah, I was feeling two ways about that. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> uh, and someone from the from that side, uh, is that? Um, I love the things. How did your work measure up compared to other courses? <laughs> Sorry. I thought in general Okay. Um, <laughs> nice to have an objective opinion. <laughs> Even though as we know objective is not what it purports to be. But, but what, what else? Any, any other thoughts about the, how how your work stuck up? compared to everything else in the show? It was less traditional. Less traditional? Did you feel embarrassed by what you have done? No. Did you feel proud? Did you feel that you did, that you, that you did work in the show? Did you, feel that you show? did you feel that you offered something interesting to the audience? Mm. Yeah? Because I, I, thought that, I, I thought it was a fantastic show. I probably the best so far of the, all the interview shows, um, partly because I think the, the space was very good for the kind of work it was on show, because it has so many different environments and each one could be curated in a different way. And because it was lit well, it made a big difference. Previous, the previous show, uh, well, you, you remember it from last year, it was kind of grotty and very dark. Would you think it's a better space this year? It's just too small. It's small, yeah. Everything's fun, just like the size. Yeah. yeah. But somehow about the way it was kind of really intense and crowded and you had walk in the toilets and on the stairs and over the stairs and under the stairs, it, it really felt that you are in this immersive environment. So we sometimes have four people installing in this room and sometimes with the second year we have 15 people installing. And it still kind of works. So I think at least for me, it was really clear. I think it was very clear for me in the interim show what are we working for and why it is hard and what are we doing through the installs and the seminars. What are we trying to tease out? Because the work, the work you have done, I thought pointed to some really original 
intense thinking that you have been doing. So I do hope um, you have a sense. I also hope that you enjoy the install. Some people said it is messy. Yes, it is messy for a reason, you know. There is a sort of... I mean, messiness is another thing we need to, we need to try to think about. Um, it somehow connects to the question of clarity. Do things always need to be clear and neat and tidy and have everything in, in the right place? Or is there a problem with that? It's, it's, it's a question that we're going to somehow approach today through the, through the seminar. So just so we, uh, so you know, and while well, people are still uh, settling down, um, this is the last seminar of this term. Next, and we will uh, finish, well, we're not, we will not finish with Karen Barat, but at the last session on, on Karen Barat. And um, next term, we going to read uh, about simulacrum, and we're going to read about the rhythm and about rhythm and repetition and so we're going to spend some time reading Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari, a famous big book that people are running scared of because it's so crazy and doesn't make any sense but you will see that it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, we're going to read uh, an essay by Deleuze uh, on Simulacra and um, and if we have time, we probably will have time, we we'll also have a look at um, Soren Kierkegaard, which was a very interesting 19th century um, anti-romantic. And that might, that might be, but, but, but if there is still a, a, another session, then we will also look at Foucault, Michel Foucault, and um, his essay on heterotopias, other spaces, and his uh, reading of this famous painting by Velasquez, Las Meninis. So that's the plan for next term. So you just know that, you know, um, we're going to, and once we start looking at Simulacra and a thousand plateaus, you will start feeling that some of the threads that we engage with here are getting tied together. That's, that's the plan. We will also spend parts of each seminar uh, addressing the research paper. Yeah. So there will be at least one session when we, will, when we will work together as a group on developing a research question. So everyone knows what is your question and you can go and start collecting materials for it and you will build a file. That will um, take you through the summer. By the time you come back in autumn, you should have a research file. You don't need to write it, just collect materials. From that, you will work with Anke to write your beautiful research paper next year. That's the plan. Um, <coughs> any questions? Any comments, requests? Okay, right, so, let's begin. Um, before we begin, or as, as a way of beginning, are we recording? So, I want to dedicate this session to uh, Stephen Hawking, who uh, died today. And, um, and interestingly, we're going to read something about him today. And it, it's not without, uh, it's, it's not irrelevant to, to our reading of Karen Barad because um, she draws her feminist philosophy from quantum physics and Stephen Hawking uh, was um, one of the greatest uh, astrophysicists. Um, so many people, at least both his book, The Brief History of Time, some people read half of it. Um, somebody, or anyone, anyone heard, anyone came across this book, A Brief History of Time? Yeah. yeah, it might be a good time now to go back to it and read it over Easter. It's a short book, it's about 100 pages, but it's very dense. Um, 
very large number of people start late and didn't finish. But you can finish it. You have the you have the tools. Um, so I don't often uh, dedicate a session to someone who died. But it's the the last time we done that uh, was when um, David Bowie. Yeah. Um, okay. So now I think we are ready to begin. So keeping my ear to the ground. I hear from some of you that Barad is difficult, that it's difficult to read Barad, it's difficult to make sense of it, and I get it. I think it is true, it is difficult. I just recently um, was an external examiner on a PhD thesis that is an art PhD thesis that uses Barad. And one of the discussions we had uh, among the examiners is why Barad is so popular with fine art students. I mean, the popularity of Barad with artists surprised Barad herself. She has herself been known to say that you know, she doesn't really understand why artists read her. She didn't write for artists, she wrote for physicists and for um, feminists and for people who are interested in identity politics. Uh, but artists find her work very helpful. So it would be a real shame for you to walk away from the sessions without really getting, you know, what people find about her work that is so useful or so challenging to traditional ways of thinking. So that's what I want to start unpicking today. And so the, the conversation will take us on several journeys and but first let me find my place in the <coughs> so I guess how to, how to begin a session is a tricky thing. I'm going to begin from a question. Is everyone comfortable? Can everyone hear? Okay, this is really irritating the, the AC. I'm told that I need to order a switch that will be here, then we can monitor it ourselves. And it, but it takes some time to install it and it probably will be it will probably happen for next year. Um, uh, so but can you hear that at the back? More or less, yeah? Um, if, if you don't hear, if you kind of feel that you are not uh, you know, uh, involved, then, then um, do something and maybe I will speak louder. Um, do you hear me over there? Do you hear everything? Yeah. Okay. So, what is Barat talking about? What she's talking in, in, the, in this chapter, we only read the, in, the introduction for, not the introduction, the epigraph for, uh, from Donna Haraway. Um, she's talking about, uh, about diffractions and entanglements. So what are these diffractions and entanglements? What question they are raise or what question <clears throat> they are trying to answer. So here is a here is a question that is kind of quite simple. What is the inside and what is the outside? It's a question for all of you to think about right now. What is the inside and what is the outside? When we talk about the inside, what we normally mean? The inside. What we normally mean? What is happening inside? Is anyone there? Is anyone here? What is happening inside? 
Is anyone in? Can anyone hear me? Is there anybody? What is what is happening inside? Is there anything there? Where is the inside? Well, talking about well, what do you know about the inside? Where is the inside? Shall we start from the outside? Is the outside any easier? Do you know where the outside is? You need to engage people, you need to think about it. Where is the inside? In a dimension. No. No. What is the inside? No, I mean, where is the inside? What is the inside? Beyond the outside. Sorry? Beyond the outside. Your thoughts? Conscious thoughts. Okay, thank you. So the inside is consciousness. What else? Good, thank you, brother. What else? Personal feelings. Great, thank you. Personal feelings. What else on the inside? Smell, taste, feelings, ideas. Yeah, that's on the inside. Okay? Now, what is on the outside? Everyone else. Everyone else. The so-called the real, or as some people say, the real real. Yeah, to differentiate it from the inside, which is also real, but the outside is the real real. So, the question is, well, first, just so you know, this distinction between the inside and the outside is completely wrong. Yeah? That's not the right way to think. We're just going to stick with it for a while to try to get a little bit forward. Yeah? But it's a, these are kind of lay terms, inside and outside. Do you know what are lay terms? Can, can someone explain what, is a, what are lay terms? Non-expert. No? Non-expert. Non-expert. When you say about something that, well, you are speaking in a lay language, it means common language. It means that if you write your dissertation in this language, you will fail. Yeah? It's the common language. So, in lay terms, there is inside and outside. Yeah? The inside is the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, the concepts, the ideas, and the outside is the things, the objects, yeah, the entities. Now, the question is, if we, as I said, the, these are lay terms, the, the, this distinction between the inside and the outside as two separate entities is, is wrong, but we're going to stay with it for a while because it can still be useful. So the question is, this inside and outside, do they ever meet? Do they ever go for a walk together or for a slice of pizza or something like that? Or bubble tea, yes. <laughs> Sorry, now I don't hear. Okay, okay, the, the, you are already speaking like a some of the red barat. Good. But, but, <laughs> but let, let, excellent. Um, and that's right. But how, how do the inside and outside ever meet? Now, there are several ways to approach to answer this question. Depends on where you're coming from. Some people will say they never meet. The outside and the outside, the inside and the inside, and they are completely different. That means, if you believe that they never meet, you also believe that there is nothing we can be absolutely certain about the world outside ourselves. Yeah? Because, how can we be sure? You know, you put your hand on the table, but how can you be sure that this is really, that it is really there? Yeah, so, so that's one approach, they never meet. There can be another approach that says that they do meet, 
but they only meet in a simulacra, in a virtual space. Yeah? They only meet in a kind of fourth dimension. We're going to explore this more closely next term, this approach. Um, but Karen Barat has another way of talking about, okay, let's, before we get to Barat, the, the normal way of explaining how the inside and the outside meet. And maybe before I answer this question, let me just put a pause here, I got a little brief now, because yeah, you are dying to know. Uh, what art has to do with this question of the inside and the outside? Can someone tell me? What do you think art has to do with the question of the inside and the outside? It's close where they meet. It's where they meet. Maybe. Yes. Simulation between art and the world. Simulation? Relation between the art and the world. Okay. Anyone from the from this row <coughs> that I have back, has any thoughts about that? What is the, is this question of the inside and the outside relevant to think to thinking as an artist? Yeah? Do you think so, Hannah? Why do you think so? Um, because as an artist, I didn't hear very well. Did, did someone hear, let's say, in the middle of the table? Could you repeat what Hannah said? Because... Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, well, maybe it's about like externalizing the inside and the outside. Great. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, so, the usual way to think about how the inside and the outside meet is that. is via this process that is normally called reflection. Yeah? And reflection or it can sometimes can be called reflexivity in both instances, the idea is that the consciousness or the feelings or the insight is like a mirror that reflects the outside. Yeah? Now, I think it's particularly interesting to someone who works with fashion, rather, because in fashion there is a very clear inside and outside. This is the outside and this is the inside. Yeah. So what happens if we just turn them around? Uh, do you always have to have, let's say, if you make a dress, if you make a skirt or a jacket, is it possible to make it so it will not have inside and outside? So it will have just the outside? Or that it will not have uh, this division? Or are we testing or... Hi, hi, hi. Uh, are we always testing to have in and out? And if we do, what does it mean to the way we think about things? And so, so the traditional way of thinking about the way the inside and the outside relate to each other is that the outside reflects in the inside. And the inside, the consciousness, or the feelings, or the intellect, is like a mirror. And whatever comes in front of this mirror gets reflected. Yeah? So this is the theory of reflection or of reflexivity that we read last two weeks ago. We read uh, Don Haraway saying that ah, while reflexivity is this incredibly popular model of looking at this relationship of the inside and the outside, it is a problem. Now, where this problem can be seen is in the in this painting I mentioned earlier that we'll probably look at next term. 
uh, the Las Meninas by Velasquez. So, can you see? Yeah. Anyone knows or familiar with this painting? Yeah. So, um, yeah, just in brackets, Foucault has a wonderful book that's called The Order of Things. The Order of Things. It is on Dropbox, I believe. And uh, in this book, the first chapter is, the, uh, is, is his analysis of this painting. Now, and in the analysis, this is somehow very stretched, isn't it? It's, 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 it's really badly stretched on the screen. It's kind of stretched out, so that's not how the, the painting really looks. It's uh, annoying. But, uh, Yeah. Um, so we're not going to look at it for uh, for any length of time. But um, so here we have the painter painting a scene on this big canvas, and. What the painter paints? Well, the painter paints what is being reflected. But what is being reflected is something we cannot see. Because the painter paints something or someone who is standing near, which is supposed to be the king and the queen, as it happens. But because that's where we are, that's where we stand, um, we don't see the outside that the painting is about. We become this outside of the painting. But what we do see is, in a sense, how the reflection itself is happening. How the, we see the painter recording or, or painting what is outside as it is reflected on the canvas, but the reflection itself here becomes the main topic of the image. Compare this, for instance, with, um, let's say, last year we did this image. Compare it with this painting by Vermeer. And you can notice a difference between the two works, yeah? So this is this Vermeer is a very um, typical representative of a classicist approach to painting. The, the painter here captures every detail of the landscape, yeah? It looks so much like a photograph, doesn't it? It looks so precise and accurate, you could probably uh, build a map based on this painting because because of, of the precision you could forget that you are looking at the painting and just imagine for a minute that you are looking at the actual scene because it is so real yeah so here is the outside being reflected with such exactitude yeah that we really like to believe that the inside is capable of making an absolutely 100% accurate reflection of the outside. But here in Velasquez, things get complicated because here the outside is invisible. We don't see the outside. The outside is the king and queen who are the subject of this painting, but who are absent. Instead of them, we are placed there. What the painting shows us is not so much the landscape presented in all its detail, but precisely how the capturing itself is taking place. Yeah? And what we see is, if you, if you zoom in here, the quality is really, really bad. But here behind the painter, and if you have your own laptops and you can open it, you will see it better. Here behind the painter, there is a mirror, and in the mirror there is a reflection, and the reflection is of the two people who stand 
here where we are now and being painted by Velasquez. So here the, the outside is actually not outside anymore. Well, it is outside, but, but we don't know what it is. But there is a reflection. Yeah. So already here we can we get the sense that while in Vermeer the relationship between the, uh, the outside and the inside is one of reflection and it is and it is just accepted as this is how it is. The challenge for the artist is just to make the best possible reflection. Yeah? The clearest reflection, the most accurate one, maybe accurate is not the right word, but the most believable one, the most faithful one, that is the artwork. So the task of the artist is to raise the game of reflection and to make the, the best, the most perfect reflection. In Velasquez, it's kind of you feel that this approach itself, the, this Vermeer's approach, and that, that contemporaries, that's why it's so interesting to look at this work side by side. By side. In Velasquez, you, you feel that this approach is not satisfying anymore. Because the artist, I guess maybe because it's now not a problem anymore for the painter to paint absolutely precisely. So then, what is the next challenge? Well, I'm supposed to, to, to make another landscape, and then another one, and then a cow, and then what? And so this kind of gets boring, yeah? Because we already know how to do it so accurately and so well. In a sense, you don't need photography to come in, um, or perhaps if that's what, what the point of art, then really we just need to wait for photography and then we can all go home. Because in doing it so much faster and quicker and cheaper than painting. But it looks like precisely because of this perfection of uh, reflection and representation with Velasquez, the problem now is not how to picture the landscape in its detail, it's not how to capture it on all its tiny elements and how make it as believable as possible. The challenge becomes what? What is now the challenge? Question. Is there a new perspective? Right. Okay. And what does it mean? What does it mean to present a new perspective? Uh, what new perspective? And is it perspective really, that you are talking about? What do you see? What do you... So here, it's all about the detail and the precision of execution, yeah? And now this painting does much more than just showing us accurately what the city of Delft looks like. It conveys a huge amount of emotion. You know, you can feel this slightly overcast day, but still quite bright. You can really feel the light. You sort of, you know how this light makes you feel. You know, this is, it's, it's a very, rich painting with the way it, it provokes feelings in you. And yet, here, something else is happening. So what do you think is happening in the Velasquez world? It's, it's more intimate. It's more intimate, okay. But do you mean that it's more intimate because it is about people or do you mean something else? The people are looking at us, and that is true. But that, in this side of work, you could also have people looking at us. I mean, this is a landscape, but it could also be a portrait. I'm trying to suggest, well, 
But the act of looking is the subject. Great, yes. The act of looking is the subject. Yes. Uh, is it, this, this one seems to be more about representing something out there. Yeah. Whereas this is bringing you into the production of the yeah. group. Yeah. Do, do you understand what Abbas said? Did you hear it over there? Can you repeat it about it? This one is to do with that representation of some out reality outside. And this one involves you being part of the production of the image. So you can represent the production. So in other words, this is a representation of the landscape. The landscape comes to us in all its detail, in all its symbolism, in all its rich, the multi-dimensional meaning. Here, what is being shown is not so much a situation like here, but how the situation is being recorded. How the process of making the representation itself is being done. So in a sense, you might say that here, this painting shows us the representation flow. Yeah. Like, in the painting, like in the drawing of Dürer, with the artist draftsman drawing a nude. You remember that we saw so many times. It actually shows us how representation works. Something similar is happening here. What we see is not the portrait of the king and the queen of Spain. What we see is the making of the portrait, but not so much even the making of the portrait, but how, what does it mean to represent? What does it mean to really represent something? So if here the problem is how to make the situation how to translate a real situation onto a canvas while maintaining its important qualities. Here the problem is different because this problem is already solved. The new problem is how do you capture the process by which the capturing is taking place? How do you capture the process of capturing? Or if, to, say, to say it simply, if this image represents a city or represents a landscape, this image represents representation. Yeah? Now, which one do you think is the more... What should, what, what, what should we use? Which one is closer to how you walk? And, and I want to say that this is, both are marvelous artworks, you know, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, this is beautiful. Uh, it, is a, it is a representation painting, but it's a sublime work, and if you happen to see it in, in real colors, you know, and not, as, uh, in not even, even on the screen, some of its energy is, 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 uh, is uh, palpable. Both are wonderful. It's not a question that one is better than that, but they, they use completely different thinking process. Yeah? Now, the thinking process we are exploring, in the sense that you can say, this is the journey that we are on. The journey is from here to here and to Einstein. Because with Einstein, with quantum physics, these questions of how to represent representation acquire a new additional twist. So we're going to get into all of this um, hopefully today in the next couple of hours. But what is noticeable in this in this image in the Velasquez is how it is how you already can see the entanglement working, how the subject of the painting that the Velasquez, this is Velasquez himself by the way, that's him standing here with a, with a brush and the palette. And he is, so what do you think is painted on the canvas that we don't see? We see the back of the canvas, that is also interesting. This is 
and a painting that shows us its own battle. Yeah? So, inside or outside? Is this painting about the inside or about the outside? Is this painting about the inside or the outside? Okay. Is this painting about the inside or the outside? It's complicated. Okay. That's how complexity enters art. That's why it stops being simple. That's why it begins to be messy. That's why messy is okay. Yeah? Because this is not messy. This is very clear cut. The artist is an artist. 40 years training. Classically trained, as they used to say. Classically trained. A uh, painter. Where is the painter? We don't know. It doesn't matter. What the painter had for breakfast doesn't matter. That's not the question. The question is, can the painter render the scene in the best possible way? Yes, we can. Here it is. Yeah. This is the object. This is the reflection. Who did the reflection? A professional. Nothing to see. Don't need to worry about that. Yeah? So that's how people used to be trained to make art. Making the object of making the artwork in such a way that the presence of the artist is completely removed. That was the Renaissance idea. You know, uh, if you want a kind of cultural reference, uh, in the 15th century, um, the um, art theorist uh, by the name of Alberti uh, wrote a book that's called De Pintura on painting, in which he said the role of the artist is to make a painting that will look exactly as if you are looking through an open window of the glass. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any difference between looking through the window and looking at the painting. Yeah? It should be just as real. That is called Alberti's frame. Yeah? The frame of the window, the frame of the painting. You look through it, you forget that you look at the painting, you feel as if you are looking at the real thing. Yeah? That was the ideal that Renaissance art aspired to. I think we discussed it briefly in the lecture, so I'm just moving on from that. So, something happens around the 17th century, around the moment of when capitalism begins, when the, the industrial revolution, the scientific revolution begins, when suddenly the world shrinks, becomes much smaller, the new world is being discovered, America, there are revolutions, the new, new economy is set up, the capitalist economy, of exchange. Uh, in this world, suddenly, the art stops being this invisible figure that arranges things in the best possible way. The very process of painting it becomes relevant. And, and as Foucault is um, saying in his analysis, in this painting, he claims it's for the first time. But I'm not sure if it's for the first time, but, but um, in this painting, we see how representation itself, how this way of making art, this way of making art, is in crisis. Yeah? Now, that's how messiness gets in. And for that reason, you see, messy is not something to be wary of. What does it mean, messy? Messy basically means that you cannot tell what is inside and what is outside. That is messy. Things are not in the right places. Things are not when where they are supposed to be. That is messy. So, here everything seems to be conflated. We suddenly see the painter at war. The painter is not hidden from you, from you. We don't see the canvas. We don't actually see the work of the painter. We see the back of the canvas. We see the labor of the people who attached the, who stretched the fabric onto the wooden frame, you can see the nails. Now, when you leave your work unfinished, when you go and 
show us the process of making when you leave your work somehow um, and well when, when, when you let us see how it came about you follow this way of thinking of Velasquez that says look it's important to remember that the painting is on a piece of canvas and the canvas is stretched in the wood frame and there is some labor involved in that and that is also a work of art yeah so the inside and outside are being problematized. So let's take it from another dimension, from another angle, and then we move to barrage. Your own body. So we spoke so far about kind of painting and representation, but your own body, uh, your body. So they, they can look at it for a second, please. And then tell me, Where does it end? Where is the end of your body? How do we go about think? How do we go about thinking about it? And I want you to I want to think about it. There are two ways to think about it. You can think about it as a lay person. What is a lay person? What are lay terms we spoke earlier? Common terms. A lay person is a common person. Is a person who thinks in a common way. Yeah? So for a lay person, not for you, for a lay person, where are the limits of the body? Where is the limit of the body? The top of the head? Sorry? The head. Okay. That's one limit. Any other limits of the body? Toes. Sorry? Toes. Toes are the limits of the body. Skin is the limit of the body. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? So where 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 is 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 it just here? Is it is it that? Is it that? You know how children outline the or you know in the cave in, in the cave. Yeah. So is that the limit of the body? Okay. You in agreement with that? Fine. So that was the lay person's way of thinking about it. Now turn the switch, flip a switch, and I'm asking you now as a As an artist, where is the limit of the body? Huh? <laughs> no, you, 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 you sort of shook your head. There's no limit. Like, you can. Let's just make it an example of the body is connected to the outer space in one another. That's one thing to say. But then, as I said, you can find that in the space. I didn't hear everything, but did, did someone here and could, could tell us what Hannah said? <laughs> but, uh, did you hear? No. So just, just, just tell it to some, tell, tell it to Ruth, and Ruth will tell it. <laughs> 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 I think there's this idea that certain bodies like extend out to space, and like there's an idea that certain people So we're going to play this broken <laughs> uh, what, what, what did you hear? <laughs> what I heard was... Uh, <laughs> um, some, the body can extend more out into space. Yes. So it's not just necessarily to the skin. Um, I got that right? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. So... <clears throat> What is, where are the limits of the body, if you think about it, not as an artist, but as a creative person? So that's something that Barad is uh, is dealing with. I'm just looking for a section. Okay. Now, uh, I'm just dumping you into the middle of a text we didn't read. It is on page 155 because I thought if we're going to go section by section, 
if you're going to go section by section, it's going to be, it will take too long. We just have to jump inside, you have to, you have to somehow learn how to swing with it straight away. So, uh, okay. Now, just before we go into this text, so how can we think about the limits of the body in a different way? What you will see Barat saying here is that this normative idea that the body ends where my skin ends, I think it was Stephen who said it ends is the skin. What is important to understand is that it is a political idea. It's politics, or body politics, if you like. Um, it's, it's an open question, not an open question, it's a political question where the body ends. Yeah? So, already we can start to sense that we might be, we might need to do some thinking. Because what does it mean to say that my body ends with my skin? Well, it means that everything which is beyond my skin is the outside. Yeah? It means that it is already not me. Well, if it's not me, it also means that if you poke it, I will not feel any pain, because it's not me. Yeah? So, as long as everything to do with my skin is fine, I'm alright. Now, but is it really the case? When we're sitting here in this room uh, for, the night, for the last couple of hours, are we here with our own kind of boundaries around our bodies? Is something else happening at the same time? So how is it possible that we are breathing the same air, sort of participating in the same conversation, can we still really seriously claim that we are in our kind of separate micro-bubbles? Or is there something else taking place? So, now, this is very noisy, so I need someone with a, with a big voice, like the trumpets of Jericho, uh, with a big voice. Because this is quite interesting text. So could someone start reading it to us? And but, but somehow everyone has to be able to hear. I'll try. Okay. Can you make it slightly bigger? Yes. So if you want to follow it on your laptops, we are on 155. Oops, sorry. We are on page 155 and Ruth will read. Here we go. At first glance, the outside boundary of the body may seem evident, indeed incontrovertible. A coffee mug ends at its outside surface, just as surely as people end at their skins. On the face of it, reliance on visual clues seems to constitute a <coughs> solid empirical approach. But are faces and sides really what they see? In fact, an abundance of empirical evidence from a range of different disciplines, considerations, and experiences strongly suggest that visual clues may be misleading. What may seem evident to some is not simply a result of how things are independently of specific practices of seeing and other bodily engagements with the world. Rather, it has become increasingly clear that the seemingly self-evidentiary nature of bodily boundaries, including their seeming visual self-evidence, is a result of the repetition of culturally and historically specific bodily performance. In point of fact, the 20th century has witnessed serious scientific, philosophical, anthropological, and experimental experiential contestations of the seemingly self-evident point of view. Neurophysiologists, phenomenologists, anthropologists, physicists, post-colonial, feminist, queer, science and disability study scholars 
and psychoanalytic theorists are among those who question the mechanistic conception of embodiment and the presumably inherent nature of bodily boundaries, especially human ones. Cyborg theorists are among those who find it deeply ironic to stop them off. Great. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, that's, that was clearly read. Was it also clear to hear? Okay, great. So tell me what she, what, what, what she says. What do you hear Barad is talking about? It's not about the visual. Yes. Good, good. Because she says the visual clues may be misleading. Anyone has any idea of what, why visual clues may be misleading? And you are allowed to make a reference to the two paintings we saw earlier. Too much? Why visual clues may be misleading? Visual clues. Visual clues remind you of what? Thank you. Reflection, representation, this painting by Vermeer, yeah, this visual resemblance. It's this visual resemblance that Barad is attacking as not good enough method for getting to what is really going on. It's almost like she says, you cannot trust your eyes. You cannot believe your eyes. Yeah. Now, ironically, and she is completely aware of this irony, she begins this paragraph by saying, at first glance. Yeah, that's Barad's own sense of humor. Uh, at first glance, the outside boundary of the body may seem evident. A coffee mug ends at the outside surface. Okay, so coffee mug, I mean, I'm tired of making my glass always there. Uh, the Bible for the joke. So can we have another object here? Anyone has any interesting object? No, something else. Something. Okay, let's let's take this as an object. So at first sight, Barat says, a, a phone cover ends uh, at its outside surface. Yeah? In the same way people end at their skin. Okay. What will be, but what you will see at the second glance, if that is the first glance, what is the second glance? Where does this thing, where, where are the boundaries of this thing now, at the second glance? It's connected to me, I'm holding it. Okay. Right. Okay. What else? That's good. What else? But if, if let's say, it's suspended in midair without my fingers touching it, yeah, and without, let's say, the fishing mark wire or whatever, where are the boundaries of this? Now, imagine, let's just play with your vision a little, yeah? Do you know how you can see this whole room at once, from left to right, with your eyes? Yeah? You can see everything. It's not like, it's not like you have to look at the room slice by slice by slice by slice. Yeah? Now, it's, it sounds like it's a different story, but I'm talking about the same thing. Imagine that your vision was like that. Yeah? Then for me to see the room, I would have to go like that. But by the time I got here, I already for that is already there, yeah? So so if if I saw the world like this, my impression would not be that hey you and Evie are sitting at the table together. My impression would be that Evie is here at uh, ten to twelve and 
Hey, is there at, let's say, 90. Yeah? They are not in the same place. They are, because that's how we put that way, how my vision would be. Okay? Does it make sense? Right. Now, what if that's really how we look, even though it doesn't feel so? What if all we can see by looking at it with the eyes at first glance is this kind of thing that prevents us from seeing that actually there's lots of other things are happening simultaneously. Yeah? What if that's how we really see? So what would it mean? I mean, if my vision of the room is like that, what do I need to do to change it? Well, I need to somehow remove these, uh, what they're called, they re remove this kind of blocking device, yeah? Um, to see the whole picture, yeah? So, <coughs> when I say that we look, that that's how we look at the, at the phone cover, I don't mean that that's how we look at it with our eyes, but that's how we perceive it in time. Because we perceive it as being this thing in this moment in time, on the 14th of uh, March 2019. Yeah? But imagine that you could see time in the same way that you see the room. So the 18th of March 2014, 2018 would be here, and the 18th March 2012 would be there, and the 18th March 2022 would be there, and you would see it all like that. Yeah? Is it possible to imagine? Right? Yeah? So we would see, imagine if you would see time in the same way we see this room. Yeah? From beginning to end. The question is, how would we see this cover? Would it be just in one point in time? Would it stretch? It would stretch over a period of time. Yeah? Do you know how long to plot it? Long time. A very long time, yeah. Let's say until you know, another hundred years. So, in hundred years, you know, this thing perhaps will, you know, get melted and will become a, a water bottle. Okay? So, but what happened before? Yes. Are, you, are you following? Is it, you see, you see what we're trying to do? We're trying to apply we're kind of trying to play with the way we understand time and space. Mm -hmm. yeah? We say, what if we would try to think about time in the same way we think about space? With space, we see everything at once. With time, we always see this moment where we are, or just, just, be, just after. But what if we could see time like this as sort of stretched? Yeah? Or all these slices are available to us all at once. Then, then we might go back to the question of where are the boundaries of this object? Where are the boundaries? Why? It's good, but why? But why? Explain it. Explain so we can understand what you mean. Because what it was, what, so you are working now on, on a jacket, you know? What it was before it became a jacket? What it was? It was a thread or cotton, yeah? And this probably was, I don't know, what was it? Crude, oil. crude oil, yes. Um, and then there is a kind of entity that, that contains many things, yeah? Oil or some kind of raw material, some sort of making processes, some factories, some labor, some design, some artwork. And so where this thing really ends, where it stops, becomes a question of politics. It just depends what you want to ignore. Yeah? Now, It's interesting, you see, that neurophysiologists, phenomenologists, anthropologists, physicists, post-colonial feminists, queer science, disability studies, scholars, and psychoanalytic theorists are among those who question 
the mechanistic uh, who question the uh, mechanistic conception of embodiment. Yeah? So, mechanistic conception of embodiment is, in other words, this notion that bodies end at the skin or at their visual limit. So, what we're going to say is that just because your eyes suggest that that's where something ends, don't believe it. Who does she sound like? Do you hear that? Do you understand why? Yeah? It, and, and it's true. Nietzsche was saying a very similar thing in the gay science. And maybe all these things, neurophysiology, feminist queer theory, disability theory, maybe this is the gay science. One thing Barat left out is artists. But artists belong squarely within these band of brothers who question the boundaries of things. Now, I'm just going to mention one aspect here because she's speaking about disability studies scholars. So, um, uh, have you, did it ever happen to you that you spent some time in a wheelchair? No, no one ever broke a leg or had to be in a wheelchair. All right. you, you, you really are. Uh, you are really missing out. Uh, yes. Yes. And have you been in a wheelchair? So, if you spend time in a wheelchair, and um, my partner is a wheelchair user, so I know I know these things uh, very closely. If you are a wheelchair user, your wheelchair becomes completely part of your body. So if someone, say, kicks the wheel of your wheelchair, you really feel that they kick you. That is your body. Yeah? So where are, for someone who is a, a wheelchair user, where are, where the body ends? That already becomes a different question. Yeah? Now, I think it's a crucially important question for fashion, where the body ends. Because fashion seems to always accept this default idea that the body ends where it physically ends. But what if the body is infinite, like they say, as you said? Can we design a garment for an infinite body? Can we design a, a, a dress or a, or a jacket or a skirt for a body that does not end. This, uh, it's the 60s uh, this film is comedy and it's about making a this guy makes a, a jacket and never a, a road to all this. Right. Does the road? No, it does nothing on this. Uh, but do you know uh, do you know Comic Song? The And Kondigerson is a really interesting uh, design brand. But they, 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 they it's, a, it's, a, it's called something like dress machine or something like that. Uh, no. Maybe the intuition is the exhibition. You know the dress that. Yeah. What is it called? Um, Do you want to search for it? That would be great. Oh, yeah. This is... That's good. That's good. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I leave it for you to explore computer song, but it seems to me that it is one approach to fashion that really takes seriously Barat's idea that the body doesn't end where you optically see a line. 
yeah? The body, where the body, it's not that the body is infinite necessarily, but where the body ends depends on your politics. It's a political construction to say that we end here. What if we said, for instance, that my body, the limits of my body are completely identical to the, to the size of my community? What if we said that? What if I said, if let's say we are a community, yeah, let's imagine that we are a community and we said that uh, the body of every one of us is exactly the size of this community. Well, that might mean that we will view in a very different way what is to my benefit. Yeah, because if all of you is my body, then I don't have any more the separation that this is me, this is you, you know. What is outside of me is not a concern. Suddenly all of that becomes the inside. Yeah? And of course it's not that far-fetched, because in, in many cultures um, the basic unit of identity is not an individual, but a community, or a village, or a congregation. Yeah? Um, or um, for instance, in Judaism, um, there is this notion that as an individual, as a single person, it's completely pointless for you to even try to pray. There is no such thing as individual prayer. In Christianity, you just go on your knee, you know, and, 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 and you pray, and your individual prayer can go to God. But in Judaism, there is no such thing. If you want to pray, you need to have at least 10 people praying together. I think is, is that the same in, uh, in Islam? No, so uh, you have both, you have individual yeah. prayers and congregation, and they serve different functions. But in Judaism, there is no individual prayer. The whole idea is, if you want to pray, you need to have 10 people, not people, you need to have, have 10 men. Separate problem. But, but it's quite interesting that the, what does it mean the, the basic unit is 10 people, not one. Yeah? So these things are, it's, it's possible to play with these things. Yeah? All we can understand, we can understand Barat saying that the optical is deceptive. And I think that really. Um, productive to the way you guys are thinking about practice. It's not like, I don't think that Bharat necessarily tells you how to make work, but she kind of tells you what is going on in the work you are already making. Yeah? So, what else? Is there something else here? Um, Should we read a bit more? Because um, I, th I think that, that that is a bit more complex, but we're continuing we continue this investigation of the body. Now, um, do you want to break? So, The composition dress I wanted to show you uh, is somehow not here. But, uh, yeah, but okay, let's just look at this one thing. The question is, or the point is that if you take Barat's suggestion seriously, that the limits of the body are negotiable, they are open to interpretation, they are not where they look to be, then you can get at something like that. Because if you ask yourself how this kind of dress comes about, that's interesting, on so many levels. Uh, well, maybe it comes about from asking seriously, where is the body? 
Yeah. And so the, the dress is not anymore a drape for the body. It's not something to cover the visual outlines of the body, but it's something that relates to other possible dimensions of the body. So that was just uh, uh, this, this example. Now we're going to go back to the text. We just continue from what we read. On now we are on page 156. 156. Could someone then read to us the next paragraph? And then there is a short quotation from Richard Feynman. And I want to read both. So could someone uh, read to us loud and clear? Or at least, at least loud. Uh, yeah. Thank you. From top of 156. For example, scientists study the nature of sight and call attention to the fact that there is much more to the question of where a body ends and leaves the eye. In contemplating the physical mechanism of sight, the Nobel laureate physicist Richard Feynman calls into question the alleged inherent self attention of the nature of the body around. Okay, so Stephen, uh, can you read the quotation a little bit louder? Uh, Actually, shout. Shout. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Shout. And a bit slower as well. Slower. Yeah. Slower and louder. Okay? Shout, <laughs> shout, shout slowly. Can you, can you handle it? Can you manage that? Okay. I will try. Thank you. The fact that there is an enhancement of confidence in the workings of visual systems of particular animals, including humans, has long been known. In fact, it is a remarkable thing that has been commented on by psychologists many times. In order to draw an object, we have only to draw its outline. How used we are to looking at pictures that are only the outline. What is the outline? The outline is only the edge difference between light and dark, or one color and another. It is not something definite. It is not, believe it or not, that every object has a line around it. There is no such line. It is only in our own psychological makeup that there is a line. It's good, isn't it? It's very clear. Yeah? And what does it mean? What does it mean? It, it kind of reminds me of this um, idea from Prusa where it says behind every surface is a surface. Good. Behind every surface is a surface. There is no, there is no definite line where the body ends. But that also reminds me have you, do you know uh, the Voyager plaque? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, is it Voyager? Yeah, this spaceship. Yeah. Uh, Yes, that's right. So, so the Voyager spaceship, I don't remember when it was sent uh, to space, but let's say about 20 years ago. Uh, it's, uh, it's a spaceship that was just designed to go into space indefinitely. It was just fired to go and it still, still goes into space. And uh, as, a, as a sort of a welcome card or whatever, they, they put this thing there. This uh, plate or, 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 or plaque, this sort of uh, sign that designed to carry a message that inhabitants of other worlds or other planets will be able to understand. Which is, it's so telling. I mean, it, it really does say a lot about us, you know? So, for one thing, it is quite interesting that. It's the man who says hello, and the woman kind of just standing there. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry? No, I, I was wondering why they were meeting, because it's not even there for me to say that. Yeah, they are naked, they are naked but 
note also that only the man happens to have uh, any kind of genitals. And, uh, and the events sort of, sort of seems to be welcoming, even though how would they know that it's actually welcoming and, <laughs> and not saying, <laughs> you know, don't move or I shoot. Um, and then there is this helpful diagram how to find us, the third rock from the sun, you know, and that's the Voyager. Uh, yeah. and, but what is, more, what is even more interesting is that if really some, uh, some species of some other intelligence could find <coughs> that, then how they would, they would understand that we are a kind of wireframe outlines, yeah? Because it's precisely this, the, what this plug is showing us is precisely what the, uh, what Feynman is saying is the unreal. The outline is only the edge difference between light and dark, or one color or another. It is not something definite. It is not that every object has a line around it. There is no such line. So we are used through drawing and visual representation that things have boundaries. But as Nietzsche already told us, and as Barat says, there are good reasons to listen to physicists, feminists, neuroscientists. Objects don't end where the visual boundaries end. There are other ways to think about objects. So, what does it mean? It, well, it might mean that, as Nietzsche says, there are no individual things. Maybe there are no individuals. What will be the implications to politics if there are no individuals? That would be quite radical politics, don't you think? Yeah. Um, or what even politics that will say maybe there are individuals but they are not fixed in space they are changeable they are, they are changing shapes change shifting from one to another maybe maybe my body here in this classroom is different from from my body at home because my body now in here is in a different milieu in a different environment, uh, in a different network, and it is for that reason different. Because it is plugged into another system. Right? So, but there is no stopping here. Can you read a little bit further, please? Uh, Feynman understands that the state of belief or the givenness of the boundaries to be an artifact of human psychology. But there's no stopping there. Physics tells us that edges or boundaries are not determined either ontologically or visually. When it comes to the interface between a copy mug and a hand, it's not that there are X number of atoms that belong to the hand, Y number of atoms. Furthermore, as we have seen, there are actually no sharp edges visually either. It is a well recognized fact that physical objects that if one looks closely at the edge, what one sees is not a sharp boundary between light and dark, but rather a series of light and dark bands. That is, the fraction pattern. Great. Okay. So, Nilufa, for instance, that might be interesting in relation to your practice. Because it says that where the sculpture ends. So it's not like the sculpture ends here and then the next thing is a wall or the next thing is a plate or something else. In fact, what Barak is saying here, and that seems to be supported by physical evidence, is that the closer you look, you realize not that one thing ends and another thing began, begin. so the molecules of the flask end and the molecules of the hand begin. But actually, if you look really closely, 
you see that there is a continuous vibration between them. There is a continuous diffraction pattern. Yeah? Now, we didn't really speak about diffraction, but briefly, even though Varad discusses diffraction in great detail for, about, <laughs> for, for a whole chapter, what is diffraction? Just so we are again on the same on the same page. I think we can kill the version. Actually, we leave it. So, so what is a diffraction pattern, or maybe just diffraction? Where is that? What, uh, this. Yeah? Okay, well, that, that, that's a good one. I was hoping to, to have just have a, an example of water, of how, um, uh, uh, let's say, let's say this. So, so, you know how when you, when you throw a stone, in, into a lake, into a pool of water, it starts to create this sort of circular rings that expand. Yeah? And how far they expand? So you might ask, when you throw the stone, here is a stone, where are the boundaries of the stone? But that's quite clear, the boundaries of the stone are, we, we can see them. Right, but then when we throw the stone in the lake and then it generates these waves around it, yeah, you might ask, well, where are the boundaries of the stone now? And isn't the diffraction pattern also part of the stone on some level? So then the boundaries of the stone are not where the optical edges of the stone are, but they seem to be somehow expanding because it looks like the stone all the time radiates waves. We can see it when it goes into the lake, but it always doing that, even when it's not in the lake. Now, what happens if you have, if you stand <coughs> over a bridge and you throw a stone and another stone, like that, you release them at the same time. So two stones plunk into the water at, let's say, two meters distance, and both generate these circles, and then Um, let's see if we can get something like that. And then we start to get something like this. We start to get um, ripples or diffractions because the two circular waves start to intersect and create additional diffractions. Yeah? So, now we can go to the diffraction pattern and if you listen to Barad's lecture on YouTube, the passage is to be watched. If you didn't, you can still do it. Then, this is the diffraction pattern. That's what happens when these waves overlap. Now, what is important? Yes? I think the diffraction is actually what happens when it starts to... The diffraction is what, 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 what happens here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The volcano is a river. You've got the stone in What happens around the volcano is the diffraction. Yeah. And then you have the diffraction. Stephen, you are absolutely right. I stand corrected. Uh, so, what is this? Interference. Interference pattern. Yeah, because the waves interfere with each other. And the diffraction pattern is what is being generated when these waves go through the slits. But the point is that the way the way the these patterns co-produce each other in the situation of the two stones in the lake, that's how we can understand, we can take this understanding back to the way that we think about boundaries, about edges of all kinds. That's why it is a question of images, but also of politics. 
but also of identities. Yet, yeah? what does it mean to think about identity of the stone which takes into account the patterns it creates? So, To explain this point by referring to Stephen Hawking, who died last night. So, as I said, we go, it's kind of uh, <coughs> relevant. On, there is another, you see, this, this is another diffraction pattern. And that's exactly what we are talking about. So, here is. Uh, So this is Stephen Hawking and he died last night and we have this image and we have this situation and now it is diffracting or somehow interacting with the text we are reading on now and we are investigating the question of edges and boundaries and Let's read from here. We are on page 158. So could someone read to us from, uh, consider for example, yes, please, the last. Consider, for example, Stanley Stone's description of encountering Stephen Hawking at a lecture given at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Hawking has become a legend in his own right, in his own time, not only for his remarkable contributions to physics, but also because he has continued to be an extraordinarily productive physicist during his long-term struggle with ALS. Unable to speak because of the debilitating effects of the disease, Hawking communicate through an artificial speech device called a Vortrex. As Stone describes the event, the auditorium where Hawking is speaking is filled to the brim and loudspeakers have been placed out on the lawn where a zillion people have gathered to listen. She suddenly decides that she doesn't want to sit outside listening to a PA system and so she sneaks into the auditorium so that she can actually hear Hawking give the talk. She worms her way inside and manages to get a front row seat. Stone offers this description of her experience. And there is Hawking, sitting, as he always does in his wheelchair, utterly motionless, except for his fingers on the joystick of the laptop. And on the floor to one side of him is the PA system microphone, nuzzling into the Vortrax's tiny loudspeaker. And the thing happens in my head, exactly where I say to myself, is Hawking? Am I any closer to him now than I was outside? Who is it doing the talking up there on the stage? In an important sense, Hawking doesn't stop being Hawking at the edge of his body. There is the obvious physical Hawking, vividly outlined by the way our social conditioning teaches us to see a person as a person. But a serious part of Hawking extends into the box in his lap. No box, no discourse. Hawking's intellect becomes a tree falling in the forest with nobody around to hear it. Where does he stop? Where are his edges? Okay, so what what do you understand from this? Thank you. What do you understand? What what is it saying? What is text is saying? Technology enables you to 
Well, the question is, where is Stephen Hawking? I mean, well, especially today, it's an important question. But where is Stephen Hawking? She is asking. Um, Cindy Storm, she is asking. Uh, Sanderson, sorry. Where is he? She says, um, am I any closer to him when I leave the loan and I go into the auditorium? Am I any closer? to the real Stephen Hawking. And where is where where does he end? Is he is he outlined by the edges of his body? Or is he also in the computer that, that translates his voice and amplifies it? Or is he also in the loudspeakers that broadcast his voice? And if where where is the body end? Or you can also ask it about your practice. Where are the ends? Where are the limits of your artwork that you make? And that's, by the way, one of the reasons why we emphasize so much the install. Because in a normal situation, when you bring something from home and you plug it on the wall or you plug it on the table. We already accept the socially engineered idea that something ends where it physically ends. When you install something, that's when you have the opportunity to precisely problematize where it ends. Yeah? You might spread your work throughout the space, as some people already have done. Yeah? You might um, extend it through cables through wires, you might lean it onto the wall. And then, if I lean my artwork <coughs> on the wall, like this, so where does it end now? When it was standing there, you could say, well, this is it. But if it's leaning on the wall, isn't the wall now also part of the wall? Yeah? So, that was the, the case here as well. We just couldn't see it. But now, the wall becomes part because it is supporting it. So, the whole building is now activated through your artwork. All you've done is just tilted something like this. Yeah? But you see what happens. Now, yeah, you can have a good visual eye, like for instance, Alex Shady might come into this room and say, okay, that's fine. Just tilt it to one side, put it on the side, you know, or as he says, cut it in half and add more glitter. And, and it's gonna work. But that's one way to do it. You can just do it intuitively. There is another way to do it, through Barad's questioning. So but your work, where does it really end? Well, how are you going to approach this question? How, how are you going to approach the limits of your practice? It says a lot about your practice and about what you want it to do. Yeah? So for instance, Terry, I'm just thinking uh, aloud here, you might say that the boundaries of your practice extend up to back to Greece, for instance. Yeah. They are not limited with by the art school, by the you know by, by, by the room, by its physical presence. There is another form of presence. So how do we want to call this other presence that, that extends beyond the visual limits? That's the thing. We don't have a word for it. But just because we don't have a word for it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to think it or we shouldn't make a word for it. Maybe there are kind of ghosts. Yeah? Sort of, maybe there are forms of materiality, there are forms of presence that are not, which are not fully visible or fully visual. And, Abbas, can you read the next sentence? Why should our bodies end at the skin or include at best other beings encapsulated by skin? asks the author of the Cyborg Manifesto. Who is the author of, Cyber, of the Cyborg Manifesto? Don Haraway, thank you, very good. Uh, now, can you read from here as well? Just keep in problem with it. Haraway. Okay. Yeah. Um, Haraway argues that the insistence that there is an obvious bodily boundary 
that Cayman's hat and skin fails to recognize the body's specific situatedness in the world. But for Haraway, situation is never self-evident, never simply concrete, but always critical. The kind of standpoint with stakes in showing how gender, race, or any structured inequality in each interlocking specific instance gets built into the world, i.e. not gender or race as attributes or as properties, but racialized gender as a practice that builds worlds and objects in some ways rather than others. Great, let's stop here. So what do you think Haraway is talking here about? I mean, we still talk about the same thing. What is it? What are we dealing with? The, the insistence that there is an ob ob obvious body boundary that ends at the skin fails to recognize the body's specific situatedness in the world. What does it mean to be situated in the world? It means that you are always in a specific relationship to the environment you are in. And this relationship is not fixed, but it is also not ex exhausted by the limits of the body. Now, what might come helpful here is a little bit of a... Um, is something we can take from Martin Heidegger. Now, we really didn't read Heidegger this year, and I'm slightly wondering about it myself. Why did we read Heidegger? Uh, but perhaps we will, uh, we, we did, uh, we, we, we spent one session look at, looking at in, in the lectures. But perhaps Heidegger's time will come still. And if not, we will do it next year, because you will continue coming to the session next year. Just so we are clear about that. Uh, because you won, or because you have. Uh, and uh, so Heidegger says, the way we are in the world is not that we are just there as bodies. We are always in a mood in the world. You know how we are in the world. Well, we are in the world anxiously, or curiously, or tired, or waiting for this thing to stop, or thirsty. But we are always in a kind of mood. Yeah, it's a bit like um, if you cycle. You know. Um, you, if, if you have a bicycle with gears, then you can always, you can be in a gear, yeah, so you can say you climb, you, you climb the hill at a low gear and you go down here at a high gear, okay, but, but you are always in some kind of gear, even if you have a single speed bike, you are still in a gear, you, you have to be in a certain ratio between the front wheel and the back wheel, yeah, and this, that's, that's, that's a given. There's, there's no other way to cycle. Heidegger says, there is no other way to be in the world but to be in the mood. So it's kind of moody. Now, Heidegger is very moody. And he says, the privileged mood in which you are in the world is the mood of anxiety. Anxiety. What anxiety means? What is anxiety? Can someone say what is anxiety in Spanish? Ansiedad. What is anxiety in Chinese? Did you hear that? <coughs> Does it make sense? So, what does it mean to have anxiety? What, 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 what is anxiety? Anyone here has anxiety at the moment? You! <laughs> I thought it would be this, the, the, the second year. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Good, yes. Anxiety is a form of uncertainty. Uh, it's a sense of insecurity. Now, for Heidegger, this sense of insecurity is connected to the understanding that our, that we, how fragile our presence is. You know? It is so fragile that, you know, things can happen to us at any moment. We just don't know what's going to happen in the, in the next minute. So good reasons to be anxious. 
Yeah? Now, so Heidegger says, whenever you are in the world, you are in the world in a mood. And this mood, the German word for it is Stimmung. Stimmung, which means something like a mood, but not only. There is something else there, which I'm going to try to get to. I think we spoke about it uh, in the past. But, um, but do you know, how, how should we get to this question of, of, of the Stimmung? What does it mean? What, what does it mean to be in, in a mood? It's, it's, it's almost like tuning yourself to this particular situation. It's a bit like, you know, when you have a musical instrument, like a violin, and you tune a string until it is just right, until it harmonizes with another string, until they both have a kind of, you might say, they have a diffraction pattern that really works. They vibrate in the same way, yeah? So that's how you tune the string of a, of a musical instrument, of a guitar or a violin. So it's almost, something similar happens with the mood. The mood tunes you into your environment. It's interesting that in some languages, in some Slavic languages, the word, the, the word for, uh, anyone here speaks any Slavic languages? Okay, uh, how do you say, uh, a mood. Nastrojenie. Great. And how do you say to tune an instrument? Same word, isn't it? Yeah. To tune an instrument and to be in the mood is the same word. Same in German. In English is not, and therefore it's quite difficult to understand. I don't know how it is. I expect it is specifically German kind of. Uh, Germanic thing that Russians stole from Germans, like they did with, with, with most things. But it's um, it's important when we talk about the English word, which is not as good, is attunement. Attunement. Attunement is when you tune. Yeah. That's tuning something, but. Bear in mind that it's also like being in being in a mood. Now, why all why all this discussion and why we moved away from Barat? Because it's one way to overcome the notion that the body ends where the skin ends. The body all the time vibrates. It all the time vibrates as a as a string. Yeah? By vibrating, it also can activate other strings that can activate other entities and and between entities what happens is a diffraction yeah and as as she was saying earlier if you look really closely at how two things overlap or, or, or touch each other it's never simple you can see something similar something interesting in for instance uh, um, El Greco paintings So, do you know the, the famous Spanish painter from Toledo, El Greco, the Greek? Yeah, he was originally from Crete. Um, so, if you look at the way his paintings are, are fantastic, they, they, they are just one of the best things to see. Uh, if you go to Spain, but to look at the way, look what is happening here with the fingers. See how? I, it's, I, I'm not, I don't know if that will really help, <coughs> but, but just bear with me here. See how where the finger ends. So the finger doesn't really end here. The finger also carries with the kind of penumbra a sort of area where it mingles with the 
uh, you know, scarf or whatever there is, yeah, with the background, yeah. So there is the, there is the dress or the, the background, there is the hair, but the line between them is not at all clear cut. There is a sort of dark area, you know, which is sort of both, yeah. That perhaps is where exactly the attunement happens. That's the sort of the vibrations of these two surfaces somehow creating a kind of third dimension. Well, of course, none of this is visible when you zoom out. All you really see is, um, is just a very sharply outlined finger. But if you look at it at, at the way it is intended, yeah, all you see is just sharply, sharp outline. But when you look closely, there is no sharp outline. What there is, is this exactly as in Haraway, uh, there is there is no obvious body boundary and uh, for that reason the situation is never self-evident. And by the way, anyone here is good at Photoshop? So tell me, oh, this is a question. Uh, Do you know the sharpening filter, for instance, high pass sharpening filter? Before uh, later Photoshop, when they got, you know, too clever for their own time, uh, that was the main thing you had to know how to use. Yeah? And do you see that basically what El Greco is doing here is using the is he is painting a kind of a mask, like the unsharp, like the unsharp mask that how you sharpen objects in Photoshop. You sharpen them by, by creating an area of enhanced contrast around the edge you want to accentuate, around the edge you want to enhance. Yeah? So it's interesting that how the, the, the programmers who design Photoshop are actually repeating digitally a technique championed by someone like El Greco. Um, if we had a bit more time, I would show you how it works in in Photoshop, it's interesting, but it's not what we are talking about. But the point to bear in mind is that here we can also see that there are no clear boundaries. So that comes back to the question of how the work is installed. Because you could, through the way you articulate your installation, you could either accept the self-evident truth the things have boundaries. This is my work, that's where it ends. That's your work. You know how in the classroom, uh, if you've been in the kind of school that I went to, you would often sit next to someone at the table and you would draw a line on the table and say, this is my side, you know, so don't put your elbow over the line. Have you done that? Yeah? yeah? Well, we all went to the same school in here. Uh, but it's interesting, isn't it? This, this kind of boundary. Now, what Varane is saying is that this boundary is an illusion. It's not an, an, an illusion. It is a it is a standpoint with stakes in showing how gender, race, or any structure inequality in each interlocking specific instance gets built into the world. So here you have it. this is why it's a kind of answer also to you, Hannah. To the question, to the very important question you once asked me at the, at the chat we had about identity politics, you know, and you were saying, well, aren't we just moving away from identity politics? Aren't we, aren't we losing something very important? And I think it's a great question. And um, I mean, without asking this question, there's really no, this wouldn't make sense. But, but here is. The, pro, the, the, the possible problem with identity politics. Because identity politics often assume fixed identities, uh, we can have a situation with that this Im implicit acceptance of fixed identity uh, has stakes in showing how gender, race, or any structure inequality in each interlocking specific instance gets built into the world. 
So inequalities, that's, that, that's what Barat is saying. Barat is, yeah, it's uh, Barat interpreting Haraway for us. Barat, Barat and Haraway seem to be saying that this insistence on clear-cut distinctions, between this is my body, this is yours, this is the laptop, this is the table, um, clarity about these things creates a situation that helps to, to establish, that helps to show gender, race, and other inequalities as being real and anchored in reality, because the reality becomes these divisions between things. Yeah? So, progressive politics might be a form of art making that questions boundaries between objects and boundaries between enemies. And of course, it's a legal problem. Uh, Sorry? A legal issue as well, obviously. Uh, how? Well, because in, in law, we can't do boundaries. It's like, you know, Harvey Weinstein could argue that, you know, he just doesn't recognize boundaries. Yeah, of course, because you have a big boundary in order to find... Yeah, but my, my, my body is everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, now, and, and that's because, of course, it's not a, a panacea. Do you know what is a panacea? Do you know? No. Uh, panacea is a is a medicine that huh? it's a medicine that cures everything it's a kind of magical medicine yeah so so of course and, and, and uh, Stephen Stephen is right <laughs> Stephen is right that um, it it really go, it really flies in the face of many legal political identity, geographical presuppositions, okay. you know? Yes? Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear. Still didn't hear. I was going to come here. <laughs> Can you hear me <laughs> Can we... Can we exist without boundaries? Can humans be? Yeah, human being exists without boundaries. Great question. What do you think? Great question, thank you. Uh, is it possible to exist without, uh, without boundaries? Okay, well, I think there are two sides of this, to this question. One is, question one, can a human being exist without boundaries? Question two, does art need boundaries? So question one, I don't, I don't know the answer. It's for you to figure out. Question two, I think we start to get the answer. We get the answer that boundaries might be a problem for us. Yeah? Uh, well, what, Ili, it's a great question. And I think we need to speak, think about it more. So it's not, you know, it, it's not sufficient what I said here. It's a great question, and this question indicates that you are thinking the right kind of thoughts. Isn't it a great question to ask, do we need boundaries? Or are we still human without boundaries? It's a fantastic question. It's a question that you could write your research paper about. That's a large question. <laughs> it's, 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 it's brilliant. But you see, this is exactly the point of the seminar. So the questions like this can be asked, and sometimes even answered. But, you know, answering is not so important. The important thing is that a question like this can be asked and you can take this question into your practice and really interrogate it in, through the way you work with your materials. Was there anything else? Yeah, there was a pop song a few years ago and the chorus was saying, are we humans or are we dancing? Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone knows the song, but very cool. I can't remember the, the artist, but it is. Sorry? Killers. Was it Killers? Yeah. yeah, I think he's referencing this. It's like this physics stuff. <laughs> so, so, another way to think about it is 
the importance of leaving things unfinished. The importance of leaving things incomplete. In the importance of making, allowing the process to be present in the world. Yeah. So, what would happen, for instance, if in a fashion show, instead of having the models uh, demonstrating the finished garments, uh, we will have the sewing machines and the what is the name of the people who work with sewing machines? Seems but that's that's a woman. Is there is there a man? Seems seamster? Seamster, yeah. Seems person. Well, the, the 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 people who you know the sewing machines and the people who work with the machines, if we will have them on the cutter. Yeah? What would that happen? Yeah. That kind of also my question where the garment ends, where are its limits? And maybe there are different ways to bring the process into the world. But um, it really, it's actually really interesting to look at contemporary fashion because fashion often plays with philosophy uh, in, in an interesting way. So, um, what are we, where are we with this story so far? Um, we get it to understand that looking at your work as a finished object that is different from everything around it, sort of taking it up and saying, here, this is what I made. Whether it is a object or a, or a film or installation, it has already some political dimensions to it. Now, we are talking about the body as being all the time in the making or as, as she says here, uh, bodies in the making, not bodies made. Yeah. And that means that instead of considering the body as a fixed identity, what we are dealing here with is a process of becoming. Yeah. How Nietzsche says, Become what you want to be. Remember that from the Ekeomo? E Become what you want to be. Okay, so um, now, where are we? Okay, I. Uh, We are close to the end of this session. I don't know if we need to um, if we need to open a new conversation or continue with this. How? What? What do you think? Well, we are kind of trying to summarize our engagement with Barat over three sessions. What Barat is saying to you? In what way? How do you? Relate to Barat over this, uh, you know, after these three weeks of hopefully reading some of the book and uh, being in the seminars. Uh, what what did you get out? Of what 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 do you hear happening there? <coughs> there? There are no wrong answers. You know, it's um, 
It's not about how well you understood it, but, but that, what, what does it mean to, your, to you, to your practice, or anything else? Okay, can I say? <laughs> no, you can say. What, so what question I have yeah. is we didn't specifically talk about entanglement. No. So is that we didn't. Did we, did, uh, did he talk about entanglement? Did he really talk about entanglement? Okay. Let's do that. So I think we, we, we tried a little bit last time. Uh, okay. So. In classical physics, as I think we already discussed, there was a clear-cut distinction. And generally, the, the classical physics <coughs> is all about very simple and clear-cut rules about how the world is organized. Yeah? So we did, we did speak about it. I'm just going to mention it briefly. Um, in Newtonian physics, there are waves and there are particles. And the two are completely separate. That's also Baradi's chapter about it. Yeah? So, the rules that govern particles or entities and the rules that govern waves or energy are completely different. Okay? So, when things start to get complicated, when towards the end of the 19th century, people begin to realize that light is both a particle and a wave. Yeah? And suddenly, the whole very clear-cut boundary between entities starts to break down. So you can see where Barat is getting this thing, that you cannot tell the boundaries of an object. Why? Because the boundaries of the object are, guess what, are relative. The boundaries of the object are relative. Relative to what? Relative to its milieu, relative to its environment, to its conditions. So then, I think we also spoke about that, when Einstein says E equal mc square, E energy, yeah, energy equal mass and by time and square. Okay. But energy and mass used to be considered as two very different things. What is mass? Well, it's the body. What is energy? Well, it's the soul. Remember the inside and outside? So there used to be in Newton, if you like, yeah? Inside and outside are completely separate. Yeah? Inside is psychology, outside is physics, if you like. Inside is cogito, thought, outside is objects, stones. Yeah. There are no stones inside and stones do not think. Clear cut. Yeah? Body and mind. That's another one. Yeah? Body mind. Let's have another one. We can also <coughs> say image object. Okay? So all these things, all these binaries, male, female, also good. Yeah? All these binaries, inside, outside, body, mind, image, object, they all come to us as clear-cut distinctions from the Newtonian physics, from the insights of the scientific revolution. Yeah? Life was simple then. Did them when boundaries were quite clear, 
Okay, so enter Einstein with E equal mc squared and that means that energy and mass are not separate worlds but they are somehow connected. I mean, we don't need to understand this formula any more than to see that energy and mass are connected and that means that if you say that energy is the inside it means that inside equal outside as long as this outside is has to be multiplied by something and squared yeah so suddenly the inside and outside are not opposites they are somehow interlinked they are put into the same scale now now uh, what So how the inside and outside are related to each other they are I will do this not, 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 the, not the equal sign but, but this the, the three lines they are entangled that is the entanglement. Now how this entanglement actually operates, well a little bit like in the El Greco painting. Yeah, when there is no boundary. But in a sense El Greco says there is really no boundary. This really is a kind of it's not even so much a grey area, but there is a continuous diffraction, there is a continuous exchange between the boundaries of my body and the boundaries of your body. Yeah, it's because not because my skin is somehow porous and you can enter it, you know, but because what I call my body, it, it never acquired any finished shape. It is all the time being made. It is all the time in process. Yeah. Now the same sort of thing. I believe might be said about an artwork. Yeah? Where the artwork, when the artwork ends, is the plinth part of the artwork. You know what often happens, and I'm sure it also happened to you on some occasions, or you heard other people making the same, doing the same thing. Um, you bring something, and then because you know that it kind of doesn't do exactly what you want it to do, you say, I'm going to have a, a tasteful little statement next to it that will explain what is going on. Yeah? So I'm going to have a nice a little art statement that so that you know if the critic people ask you know, but, but how do you know that it is about I don't know world how hunger or whatever. So what it's, it says here on the on this, you know, how do we know it's about your family? Well it says here on this text. But then the question becomes, where is the boundary of the work? Where the work ends? Does the work end here? And this other statement is separate and is kind of explained. Is that good enough? Well, it becomes a problem because we now know already that this idea, that this, that somehow the work can be fixed and autonomous already creates a sort of a very restrictive environment. You cannot really grow in an environment that is somehow also quite um, well, as as as, um, as Barat say, quite um, stiffly. So then you might say. Good morning, as you could say, perhaps, that 
the artist statement and the artwork and in the same relationship to each other as energy and mass in Einstein's formula. They are co they co-produce each other. So maybe they have this kind of relationship. Then perhaps this is really the artwork. That the statement plus the object is the artwork. Yeah? Or you also might say that actually and that would be perhaps even more interesting, you might say that the artwork is not the object, it's not the statement, it's not the object and the statement together, the artwork is here, in the space between them. It's up to you. Yeah? But you see how Barat's way of thinking allows you to somehow step away from traditional fixed positions. Now we saw earlier, we still have a little bit open. Uh, uh, yeah. We saw earlier the, the painting by Vermeer. And how Here it seems, it seems that it is, this painting really follows the A equal A model, yeah? That's the city, that's the picture, and they, they are the same, they are identical. Now when we get to uh, Las Meninas, And we are seeing here an artist who makes the artist craft itself the question of the painting. The problem for the painting is not anymore how to make A equal A, it's almost asking what this is made of, how this thing works. Yeah? So, you see how this question of the inside and outside kind of continues to resonate. Where is the outside of the painting, of this painting? But it becomes complicated, yeah? Because the outside of the painting is the painting. The painting dealing only with the outside of the painting. Because we haven't seen the painting. Yeah, we only see the outside. All these people gathered here, you know, to entertain the the sitters during the work, you know, and some of them are just uh, looking in. This is all the outside. But the outside and the painting are in a kind of complex, unresolved, continuously mutually producing relationship. So how that informs the way you make your work? That is the question. And I think what you have done in the evening show kind of shows how is it done. You know, that's why it is messy. So perhaps this whole session we have, uh, we have to explain why messy is does not necessarily mean bad. I know that you have to go and tidy your room as a punishment. Uh, we all have to do that. But in an art school is different. And maybe you need to go and make a mess in your room. So, do we have time for something else? No, we don't really. Uh, so, you are right. We need to speak about the Tangoma properly. We might be able to do it next time when we come back after, the, uh, after Easter. So, what I want you to do for Easter, it's not a lot. It's a first step in the research paper journey. Journey. In the research paper. Um, I only ask you something very simple. To identify 
something you are interested in. About now, the research paper can be about your practice. It can be about one of the problems that your practice raises. For instance, you know, uh, if you work with video or with installation or with casting or whatever, that could be something to, to explore, but you don't have to. If you want to write it about uh, something you picked up from Barada, from Nietzsche, or something that is unrelated to your practice, that's also fine because your research paper is your practice. What is, the, what is the relationship, by the way, between your research paper and your practice? Yeah? What is the relationship between them? Is the research paper there to explain the practice? We know better than that right now, yeah? So, that's why, by the way, the assessment of this, on this course is holistic. We don't give you one mark for this and one mark for this, then average and divide by two, and that's your mark. We look at everything as your work. All of it is your practice. So, we don't give you one mark for your installations and one mark for your essay. It's all your work. Yeah? E equal MC squared. Yeah? Practice equals the mess you make, the paper you write, all taken together in the power of with a lot of power. And that's the and that's and that's it. So uh, just identify a topic. Not a question yet, even though if you want to have a go at, at writing a question, that will help. But for now, just a topic, an area. If you don't have an area, just look at your board and see what is going on there. And if there is something... Now, choose something you're going to have fun dealing with. It doesn't need to be a big important issue. It doesn't need to be... Uh, what will happen to us when computers take over, you know? You can if you want. If you want to have fun doing it, yes. But you don't have to. It can be about something mundane or simple or... It doesn't have to be anything to do with art either, even though somehow it will help you move your practice forward. Yeah? So just identify a topic or an area and that's what we will use in the future to develop a research question form. Once we have a research question, a research question which is a, a sentence of about 15 words, does that have to have a question mark? Then it will break it down into, um, let's say, three sub-questions. So this, big, this one question, we will break it down to three sub-questions. This, each one of these sub-questions will become a chapter. You need three chapters. You can have more, but I think with the 5,000 word essays, three chapters is, is the right one. And then we can break each chapter into five or six sub-sections. They will become your paragraphs. And that's basically your paper done. And we just write introduction, conclusion, and that's it. So that's called, that is called an outline. And we're going to work on that. But in order to do an outline, we need to have first a topic and then a question. So that's it. Any questions?